Welcome everyone to our Impact um, Insights webinar. Let me just share our screen here. Okay, so without further ado, again, welcome. We're very happy to have you at our launch for our M Impact Insights Summer Webinar Series. Um, before we get started, we have Dean Dale Smith here, here who would like to welcome everyone. So Dale, please. Thank you. Thanks everyone. And again, thanks for joining us here for Impact Insights. Um, this whole series began uh, when we were thinking about a business landscape that is fundamentally changing as a result of the COVID pandemic. And we wanted to engage our community in thought leadership and insights for rebuilding the business community and developing resiliency for a stronger tomorrow. It's my hope that the series of webinars we're launching this summer is our way at LMU to give back to the community. We're dedicated to bringing you valuable insights with impact aligned with our mission for advancing knowledge and developing business leaders with moral courage and creative confidence to be a force for good in the global community. We've reached out to our faculty, alumni, advisory councils, industry partners, and friends of the college to engage you in new ways of thinking about the challenges we face and the opportunities ahead as we work together during a period of economic recovery and community building. In many ways, we think of this series as an integral part of the renaissance of business in a post-pandemic world. So today and in the weeks ahead, you'll hear from thought leaders speaking to a wide range of issues critical to explore in this new renaissance, from thinking entrepreneurially with David Choi to understanding how the CARES Act can be used to improve cash flow. We'll also take a deep dive into issues around marketing for customer growth and inclusive leadership that leads to employee engagement. The topics are varied and the views diverse. We encourage you to reach out to us and so help us, share, uh, help us curate to your needs and help our region and our community stakeholders feel strong. Our hope for a stronger Los Angeles is to make an impact regionally, no, nationally, and globally. We'll continue to bring you new insights, just-in-time contact, some creativity, and what's needed for agility in an unprecedented time of uncertainty. In short, we want to share the knowledge, skills, and abilities that will lead to successful rebirth in a recovering community. Through intimate dialogue and commitment to build bridges among us, we're happy to live our mission at CBA and in the spirit of our Jesuit roots, truly be men and women for others. So with that, please join me in welcoming back our Senior Director for Business and Development Strategy, Nola Wanta, who will introduce our first thought leader to officially launch the series. Thanks so much, Dale. So before we get started, I just wanted to provide some webinar and community guidelines for everyone um, so we can enjoy this whole learning experience. So as you know, everyone has been muted as um, they have come into uh, the webinar. Also, we were... Okay. Now I'm, am I, yeah, now you can hear me. Okay, great. Sorry about that, everyone. Um, so as I mentioned, all participants are muted during this presentation. Um, we also recommend that everyone set their Zoom uh, to speaker view. During the presentation, please feel free to type your questions in the chat window for the presenter. Uh, you may also type your questions in the Q&A window. Uh, these questions will be moderated after the presentation. And uh, finally, we will leave time for an interactive Q&A at the end of the presentation. So at that time, please raise your hand and we will unmute you. And once you're unmuted, you may have the option to um, unvideo uh, yourself before. So with that, um, I'd like to introduce Professor David Choi. David is Professor of Entrepreneurship and Director of the nationally ranked Fred Kiesner Center for Entrepreneurship. He has taught undergraduate and MBA courses in entrepreneurship at LMU, as well as several other institutions around the world, including Peking University and Korea University. David is, the, is a winner of the President's Fritz B. Burns Teaching Award at LMU and the Innovative Pedagogy Award from the United, United States Association of Business and Entrepreneurship. He has been featured or, and quoted in many business publications, including the Wall Street Journal, Los Angeles Times, Fortune, and the LA Business Journal. Professor Choi has been an entrepreneur and a small business owner in several industries, including foods, nonprofit, and financial services, and life sciences. And with that, Professor Choi, please take it away. 
Thank you, Nola. Thank you for the introduction. And thank you, Dean Smith, for your uh, remarks. By the way, I look at the list of attendees. I'm seeing some of my old days uh, students from a long time ago. You guys know who you are. You never email me, call me, contact me. But I'm glad you're participating today. Um, let me see if I can share my screen. All right, slideshow. Can everybody see my screen? Okay, great. So the title of my talk today is Charting a Path to Recovery, Strategies for Small Business Owners. It's a wonderful title that NOLA helped put together. So thank you, NOLA. Um, just a little plug before I start about the LMU Entrepreneurship Program. We've been around for 48 years now. Our mission remains to instill the entrepreneurial spirit in all of our students. I think I can do this with, in, uh, without looking now. Help them become business leaders and role models of tomorrow. And of course, we want to contribute to a more prosperous and sustainable world. <clears throat> and uh, we continue to be um, recognized as one of the top programs in the country, thanks to the help of so many people. All right, let me get started with the actual presentation. So as many of you know, the coronavirus case numbers are still on the rise, unfortunately, in the US. We're not leading the world in terms of how effective we are in treating it. Having said that, our new cases per day have been sort of stabilizing and decreasing across the US, which is great news. So we may have flattened the curve a little bit, and we're in this period now, which you called, uh, which you call the fight period. Hopefully, you get to the vaccines and treatment and reach the future uh, and sort of the normal period. The question is, how long will this fight period be, right? And how bad will it have been when we get to the future? So this is the part that's very frustrating for many small business owners, this big uncertainty. Although there are some signs of hope, as many of you know, we saw pretty good job numbers last week, although the numbers are a little bit wrong um, in how they calculated it. One of the biggest surprises to me has been the stock market, which of course applies to big companies, not so much to small businesses. The stock market today is about as good as it was towards the end of 2019, which is almost uh, ridiculous, but uh, people with retirement accounts like us will, will take it. Uh, but there's a huge difference between Wall Street and Main Street. And the difference has never been so clear as today. A small business situation is different. And that's the world that I'm, I'm exposed to uh, most of the time. Two thirds of small business say that they have less than three months of cash. And that was about a month ago. Now, some of these companies have gotten PPP and EID and all kinds of grants and uh, tax credit and so on. So maybe the tax, maybe their cash will last another month or two. Um, when they were asked, how soon will a business be at risk of closing permanently? About a third said less than two months. And that was about two months ago. So millions of small businesses are at risk have a few months of cash. Anecdotal evidence that I hear is even more convincing, sometimes more descriptive. So most cities are running at around half of the usual revenues due to the lower sales revenues, sales tax revenues. Commercial real estate owners, the ones that own streets and stuff like that, are collecting somewhere between 10 and 30% of the usual rents. The big tenants, the big retail or big gyms that we know about, have used, have mostly stopped making lease payments. Okay. Restaurants are doing about 50% of their revenues and 30% of them are probably gonna close 
permanently. They're too deep in payments. I'm sorry, I'm getting a little, uh, sharing depressing news. Um, hundreds of small businesses have already permanently shut down. And many businesses tell me that they cannot survive while meeting the CDC guidelines for distancing and so on. So many businesses are considering closing shop altogether. Situation is not equally bad in all businesses. Some are actually doing pretty well. So cleaning services, delivery services, groceries, liquor stores. And if anybody tried to buy some dumbbells for exercising, but fitness equipment companies are doing well. I know many of my former students are actually gardening these days and gardening suppliers are doing well. Mask makers are doing well. Papa John's is doing well. So some did well by moving quickly while others were just fortunate to be in the right industry. When I talk to people who are very depressed about the economy today, because it affects their businesses. It reminds me of the Asia financial crisis that I was part of. I was in Korea in 1998, doing consulting work with about 10 large corporations when the stock market, market was down 70%. Out of my 10 clients, none of them was making money. And I left the country thinking, this is, situation is hopeless. Just a year or two later, I realized all the clients I was working with were doing well. And then I realized I totally missed something in my business training. I, I didn't just see certain things uh, when I was doing the work there. And what I missed there was businesses are more than a compilation of assets and financials and strategies and operations. They're at the end of the day made out of people. And when people are determined to turn around the business. I learned that what seemed impossible economically and financially, those things can be turned around. And that was a big learning experience for me. So if you're a struggling business owner today, I think these are the questions you might wanna ask. And it's a valid question. Do I want to save my business? Or is it wiser to fold, take a, long deserved vacation for a couple of months and get back. And a month ago, I would have said, uh, it's probably a lot of people would, would be thinking that it might be wise to fold. And by the way, this presentation is a bit more the hardest one for me to put together because things have been changing so quickly that uh, uh, most of the slides I put together two weeks ago became irrelevant. But I think it makes sense with the new hope in the economy for many businesses to want to, uh, want, to uh, want to save them. If you want to save the business, then the question is, what do I want or need to achieve in my business? Say in terms of revenues, the next six months, let's set a goal to get to the other side. Let's see your objectives, 50% increase. That's fine. And let's ask the question, what changes can I make to my business by leveraging what I've built, right? It'll help me, number one, survive today and then thrive in the future. What can we do? That begs the last question, which is, what is my business? And if you think about your business, you've got your relationship with vendors, you got your employees, you got your product that's been shown to have a market fit, you got your inventory, you got your sales channels that you can utilize. Of course, you got your customers. And underneath all this infrastructure is the entrepreneurial spirit of the business owner that built the business in the first place. So with that entrepreneurial spirit and the innovative capacity of the business owner, maybe there's something we can do. So maybe because I miss sports, I use sports analogy. I think there are certain defensive measures we can undertake and probably certain offensive measures we can pursue, okay? On the defensive side, there are quick and, uh, quick and deter decisive actions that one can take. 
That's all about preserving and accessing cash. About a month ago when I thought about this presentation, it was all about preserving cash. And, but then we're gonna talk about offensive measures in a minute. But around the defensive measures, measures and it comes to preserving cash, any expense you have in the business, you gotta find a way to reduce them. If you have insurance payment, reduce coverage, you probably have a smaller business today anyways. Rebid for new coverage, negotiate every contract, right? Your rent, see if you can defer them. Um, if you've got employees and management, see if you can reduce management pay. See if you can furlough some employees, even though it's a terrible thing to do. They do, have, they do need a place to come back to in a few months when your business is up and running and doing better. If you've got receivables and some people are not paying, offer discount to get cash immediately, right? And if you've got inventory and assets, sell all inventory, even sell certain assets that are non, non core to your business. Some have sold their excess capacity, like uh, part of the office, part of the warehouse, part of the freezer, part of the truck fleet. And of course, got to get all the government grants, right? PPP, EID, all these tax credits and so on. And what I see is that business that cut deeply and moved quickly a couple of months ago are in a good situation today. And some business weren't as deeply affected a couple of months ago, they're slowly being affected. Those need to take quick defensive measures as well. But what I really wanna focus on for the next maybe 12 minutes is offensive plays. And I've asked my colleagues from uh, across the country to give me good examples of companies, small businesses that have had uh, made some good, interesting offensive plays. So I got some examples from Los Angeles, from Seattle, from Denver, Louisville, uh, Honolulu, and so on. I don't have time to share all of them. I'll share a few of them. So I grouped them into three different kinds of plays. Play number one, same product, different infrastructure. Play two, same infrastructure, different product. Play three, different product, different infrastructure. Now, all these strategies are quite uh, innovative, but uh, what I've been really excited about and impressed about has been the speed at which these companies have been moving. I've never seen companies move so, so fast in the past. The first example is same product, different infrastructure, companies going virtual, right? And to be honest, LMU, like other universities, did that too. We talked about going online for decades, and all of a sudden we did it in a couple of weeks. This particular example is a music store with bulk of its revenues coming from hundreds of music lessons every week on its facility. Because they had to, had to close their facility, they switched to online lessons during a one week period and was able to maintain a significant majority of its lessons and its revenues. Um, there are other companies like Camp Gladiator, a fitness company that uh, usually does in-person training, went to virtual training and was able to maintain a big portion of the revenue. Many vineyards are offering virtual wine tasting. You think, how could that work? It's actually working pretty well. Uh, so many of these companies went virtual and thereby maintained a significant portion of their revenues, but they did something else. They developed a new channel for service they can use for the future. So they can, they found a way to survive today and maybe thrive in the future. Another example of a company doing same product different infrastructure is Good Clean Food Hawaii. They offer a healthy food subscription sold through CrossFit gyms, lately loud in the media, CrossFit fitness uh, centers. But these gyms have, been, uh, have had to close. So the, the company lost its sales channel completely. You can imagine this company being very scared 
and having had to been forced to create its own fleet of cars to deliver foods to people's homes. But they were, what they were able to do in that process was actually expand their sales channel and deliver to the entire island. So when the gyms come back, they'll have two separate effective channels, the gyms, and now their own fleet of cars that reaches the entire island. Another example of same product, but different infrastructure, is a art gallery out of Louisville. It's an art gallery facility that houses the work of maybe 150 different artists. And when the, when the art gallery had to close, at the time, the e-commerce portion of the business was maybe 1% of the revenue. The owners learned how to do online marketing, expanded the e-commerce portion to 30% of the revenue. So now that the uh, store can reopen uh, soon or very, very soon, maybe they did already, uh, they, the owners say they plan to keep both channels going forward. So again, they'll have a chance to, uh, to expand the business in the future by taking actions that help them survive uh, <clears throat> for the last several months. Play number two is same infrastructure, but different product. Okay. Barkari Play del Rey is a hip restaurant located in West LA. I have tasted their food. It's good, very tasty, uh, very hip. Um, <clears throat> when the restaurant, the sit down portion of it had to close, the revenues of course dropped significantly. So what Bakara did was open up a grocery store in the facility, selling produce, meat, breads, dairy, paper goods, and more. You'd think, well, maybe this will cover 5% of the revenue. It's like a gimmick. It's not going to really help. Uh, this is a uh, picture of the sign on one side of the restaurant. And when I drove by a couple of times, I always saw a line of customers. And the waitress told me that the business was, the grocery business was very, very busy. And then I finally got to talk to the owner. The owner says, grocery business was pivotal in our survival for the last two and a half months. It, it enabled us to cover our overhead expenses, hire back our staff, get much needed supplies out to the neighborhood. Have to report we're back open as a restaurant as of this past Friday. I know they're having seating outside and again, being innovative, but um, uh, these kind of examples give me hope that there are um, innovative ways to keep businesses open. Another example of Play2, same infrastructure, different product, is an outdoor, um, clothing apparel accessory business. They sell mostly handcrafted goods. This is out of Denver. Usually a very popular business. Big portion of the business comes from the t-shirt sales in, as a wholesale uh, business. Of course, the clothing shops close down and 85% of the revenues vanish. The owners keep a very uh, detailed blog of the business. So I was able to get a lot of information about them. They switched to making face masks, of course. They also started a new product uh, category called Stay at Home Collection, selling campfire matches, candles, towels, cups, and so on. What, the, uh, what I learned is when they switched face, face masks, they got thousands of orders and were able to cover a certain percentage of their usual revenues. Uh, they have recently stopped making face masks. They're now making t-shirts again. The business looks like it's opening and hopefully they'll do well going forward. Two more examples. These are my two favorite. One is, um, again, same infrastructure, although maybe slightly different and drastically different products. Canlis is a very fancy restaurant out of Seattle. A James Beard winning uh, award-winning restaurant, high-end, fine uh, dining. These guys went through a huge transformation when the sit-down portion of the restaurant, which is basically all of the restaurant, had to close. 
they transformed themselves into three different businesses. In the morning, a bagel shed, breakfast place. At lunchtime, a drive-through burger joint. And then a family meal delivery service on the weekday evenings. Okay. According to one of the local newspapers, the company was able to keep all the employees on payroll. And according to Mark Candis, he says, you have to play as much offense as you do defense. So we have to think about, you know, what would you, would you do if you had to do this from scratch? And they were able to create three different restaurants, by the way, using their parking lot uh, for the uh, drive through burger joint and so on. The last example is my favorite. It's an it's example of different product, different infrastructure, requires a lot of imagination. Uh, I'm thinking of two separate food tour businesses, one in Euro Europe and one in the US. The one in the US is a multi-million dollar food tour business. Uh, so people go on certain city, they, get, they do a food tour, they pay the food tour company. This company was doing several million dollars a year in revenue. And of course, travel stopped and the revenue crashed. So what they did was they leveraged their existing relationships with vendors and customers and went from a food tour business to a food box business. Uh, very different businesses, two very different businesses. And you would think this food box business might maybe make up some lost revenue. Well, it turns out this food business is currently exceeding the usual tour business revenues. And you can imagine when the food tour business comes back, these guys will have two solid businesses, two large businesses to benefit from for the future. So again, another way to find a way to survive, but prosper in the future. Now, of course, there are gonna be some businesses um, that for whom the solution is not so clear. What do you do if you're just not allowed to operate? That's your, your big event promoter. You know, what do you do if you're forced to um, operate with such restrictions, it just cannot be profitable, right? Or what do you do uh, even with the new sales channel you try, like a new online channel, you just cannot break even. So there may be no one simple, one size fit all solution for all businesses. But I think 80, 90% of the time, if I said, let's say a toy store on Main Street, I think you can think about the business models that I discussed, same product, different infrastructure, right? Same infrastructure, different product, different product, different infrastructure combined with the entrepreneurial spirit of the owner i bet we can probably come up with some good action steps for surviving for the time being and maybe even thriving in the future so what's a small business to do i think you got to play defense you got to play offense and whatever that means, I think you got to play special teams. And, uh, you know, I don't want to take the situation lightly. I know what it's like to wake up with cold sweat on your back and have to leverage your home to invest in your business. I went through all that. I know what it's like to get really sick from worrying too much about your business. But uh, um, I think in some cases, it, it, you have no choice but to give it all you got. So in summary, what do you need to do? I think we all need to prepare for a long-term uncertain uphill battle. Take decisive actions to maintain cash and give yourself time if possible. I know it's hard to read and think when, when you're stressed, but you got to read, learn best practices. There's some good resources out there on Chamber of Commerce website and Entrepreneur Magazine website, some good free resources. 
And then you've got to take proactive entrepreneurial measures to find a way to survive today and thrive for the future in the future. I look at uh, who's participating in this webinar and not everybody is an entrepreneur, but I think it's time for everybody to be on the same team. This is a, a uh, these are tough times, whether you're a government official, banker, part of a big business, part of a small business, even competitors. I think we need to find a way to help each other out. If you're a consumer, uh, and I know I buy too much from Amazon, but maybe you can buy from a smaller business as well. And uh, this is one of the reasons LMU we're doing these talks. Hopefully it will be valuable to uh, a bunch of uh, businesses. I want to thank everybody for listening. Uh, if you have any questions, comments, complaints, or like a refund, uh, you can email me at uh, dave, david.choi at lmu.edu. And I'm open for any, any mean, tough uh, questions. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Choi. Um, so let's, we're, both, we're happy to open it up to questions. Um, you can definitely type in your questions via the chat or um, the question Q&A window. I did get a question about the recording um, and presentation of the topic for today. And yes, this is being recorded. And also we will be sharing the presentation as well. Um, so once we have all of that together, we'll send it out to all of the attendees. So, um, but definitely want to open it up to any questions anyone may have. Again, you're welcome to type it in the chat. Um, raise your hand if you'd like to interact with Professor Choi, and um, we're here. So there's, I think there's a lot to discuss, um, and it seems like everyone really enjoyed your analogies. And so, um, <laughs> uh, let's open it up for some discussion because this is what we want our Impact Insights webinar to be, not just one way, but definitely sharing of opinions, thoughts, questions, because we believe that with everything that's going on, we're going through a business renaissance. So this is a great time to have um, discussions about the presentation and so forth. So please um, raise your hand. There's several of us moderating um, or type in your questions on the chat. Oh, we have a question. Um, QB, we are going to go ahead and allow you to talk. Um, and uh, you, yes, please, Kiwi. You guys can hear me? Yeah. So, um, well, first of all, thank you so much, all, all of you, for preparing. Um, it's, it, it's like a labor of love, as someone told me, who does video every morning. Um, it, it, it's, it, it's, it's a lot of effort to do it. So, first of all, thank you. Um, there were so many things I was thinking about. Um, I, I was with my dad in the 2007 mortgage meltdown, and I kind of tell people, um, I, I know what it's like to be on the chopping block, you know, and so I know business owners, restaurant owners who are the first ones being affected because it's their, as I say, it's their crisis right now. You know, it's, it's, it's their, the first ones being affected, um, sort of as though, like I said, you know, I remember what it was like to be the first one uh, being affected by what was happening. So uh, just an observation, but um, all the examples you gave were really awesome. Uh, you know, I really can't uh, understate that I understand what it's like when you're pivoting a presentation, uh, trying to stay current and relevant each day. So um, I, I, it was really more um, just asking you for more analogies. You know, it's like, I almost want to sit here and be like, hey, like, how much more time do we have? Like, can you just keep talking and just like keep going? <laughs> So I wanted to just kind of ask you um, more like, what is it that you're doing or what is it that you see as far as maybe specifically something that sparked my interest was cash, like when you talked about that. Um, I know I tend to be an offensive player on my team, you know, like hence I raised my hand to ask questions today. Um, but, but, but I also really found it interesting that, do you believe that there is a specific metric or do you think there would be a, a, a possibility in the next few months to, to kind of, or like the next weeks to share? Obviously cash depends on the industry, correct? Like I always tell people like I sell paper in the mortgage industry. It's a little bit selfish. I say that like my job is quite selfish because there's not as a cash. So then what do we do? You know, we have to create content, right? 
but as far as cash, our cash is salaries. I always talk about we have manpower in our company. Um, and so we have to have salaries, but what does that look like in terms of, of months, you know, or in terms of, you said that people are only saving zero to three months. I just wasn't sure if there was in the future or something that you've thought of on that, of what the industry examples are. Um, yeah, I th you know, the, the, as I mentioned in my presentation, the biggest problem I think it is in a way is the uncertainty, right? So we don't know how long, um, you know, like economy is going to be, you know, in a place that's, uh, it's, it's sort of reduced, right? We found out we're in a recession finally, it was obvious, but um, so we don't know how long this recovery period will take. We don't know if you're gonna have a second outbreak, right? Um, we could probably have a, a mild outbreak um, in the next few weeks. We could have a huge outbreak in the fall that could, again, make things uh, very bad, Ho hope not. So, you know, I think all you can do, you know, as, a, as an individual or anybody or a business owner, is find a way to uh, preserve and access as much cash as possible, right? So a student of mine, for example, who's got a business, he applied for a loan, business loan, and, and has it approved. He hasn't used it, right? And he doesn't know if he needs to use it, but he got it approved just in case, okay? So I, I think uh, you might wanna you know, take some pre precautions and find a way to, you know, to be extra cautious about cash so that if something really bad happens, you can still stick around and uh, find a way to um, get to the other side. Well, I, I really appreciate it. And, and Nola, I really appreciate, um, one thing I was actually uh, sharing with the community is that telling people to, to openly stand with Blacks in our community. And one thing that I thought was pretty awesome, you being on the panel was that, um, you know, I, I never lived uh, in the physicality of the life of a person of color because I came out looking more like my mom. Um, but digitally, I do experience it with my full <laughs> birth name, right? Yeah. So, so um, but what I will say is that I, I want to acknowledge that um, it, it's interesting because the mindset that you're sharing right now of protecting the most vulnerable parts of our economy is the same reason why you have to stand and protect the most vulnerable parts of our eclectic economy. And so the most vulnerable people being black people right now. And so I think that what's interesting to me is, is that there's a mindset that's a very cohesive in, the, in what you're presenting, you know, is that you have to uplift the most vulnerable parts, meaning the restaurant industry. We have no problem saying I stand with restaurants as vulnerable in the economy. You just have to have it interchangeable with what is going on. So I really appreciate the way you guys presented it. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll stop talking now, but I really wanted to acknowledge you guys because it's really good. Thank you so Thank you much. much. Thank you. Thank you. So um, Lindsay also has her hand up. So let me go ahead and allow you to talk. And again, thank you, QB, for the questions. Hi, can you all hear me? Yeah. Yes. Perfect. First of all, thank you so, so much for organizing this. It's been really great to hear all the different strategies that businesses are implementing in this really, really difficult time that we're in right now. Um, so my question is not necessarily relevant to this specific moment, but looking forward to the future for those of us that are looking to potentially start small businesses in a few years when the economy is hopefully at a better point than it is now. Um, do you have any specific strategies that you'd recommend in terms of saving money, diversifying offerings, different things like that to ensure that we're prepared for different economic situations or any turmoil that's apparent, like what's happening right now? Um, well, you know, one of the things I might say is if you're interested in starting a business uh, after the economy's improved, you can still make a lot of preparations today. Okay? It takes a long time to get a business up and running. And uh, so I would, I, would, I would start with preparations as soon as possible. And then some people would say, you know, the uh, recession is the best time to start a business because all the cost you'd be thinking about associated with the business is the lowest at the lowest during a recession. So uh, sometimes it can be the right, right, right time to uh, start a business. Of course, anytime you want to start a business, you want to find out that you are solving the right problem. So, you know, be really clear about the problem you're solving uh, out. Um, I'm not one of these people who say, you know, just believe in your business, uh, spend all the money you have, get something started, right? 
see if you can experiment and, and, and learn each day a little bit about the idea you want to pursue. Uh, you know, and then, you know, little by little, spend a little, invest a little bit more extra to start your business. But uh, in one way or another, I, I, I would get start, started as soon as possible. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Lindsay. Um, we do have a question from Dr. DeMello um, in the Q&A box. So he asks, using the sport analogy, what are your thoughts on expansion teams, startups launching during times like this? What advice do you have for new businesses? Why is Dr. DeMello asking? <laughs> that is my question. <laughs> well, like, like I mentioned again, I think uh, uh, if you can, you know, you know, what most entrepreneurs do is, what differentiates them is, they usually don't say, I like to do something in the future. Right? They usually say, I like to do something and I want to do it now. I want to get started now. Right? That's what usually differentiates most entrepreneurs from, from non-entrepreneurs. So anybody who's thinking about us starting a business, one way or another, I'll try to, I'll try to find a way to get started. Right? And you know, companies like Airbnb and there, there are a whole bunch of them we know about that started in a recession. So, you know, as, as you know, Nola, we're, we're, doing, we're starting many initiatives in, in CBA uh, this year, uh, you know, ranging from our family business program to new master's program. Um, so, you know, we welcome challenges even in a, in a recession. Great. Um, we, uh, Chris Manning, who has a question. Let me go ahead and allow you to talk. Uh, David, I want to thank you for an excellent presentation. Having been in your place, I understand the challenge of keeping current. Uh, my expertise, you know, has been more in cash flow and finance and real estate. But um, what I'd love to see you and uh, I think other people like to hear about uh, is in addition to the kind of solutions of the entrepreneurial spirit that uh, you've already elaborated on, uh, I'd like to hear talk more about the opportunity of partnership and how, for example, a struggling restaurant owner could be talking to other struggling restaurant owners, not only for creative ideas, but the opportunity for merger, uh, sharing cash. Sure. And they say, well, wait a minute, uh, I would have enough for both of us to survive and it could be a competitor. What better opportunity to get a bigger precise the mark and share it? It's yours. <laughs> you know, I, I did. Uh, I did notice examples. I can't think of them right now, but I, I did when I was doing research. Notice companies, even competitors, who are sharing resources and finding a way to work together. Certainly, you know, industry organizations are working together, you know, with the city and so on to uh, uh, get certain help and so on. I've noticed, for example, you know, Facebook trying to. Um, allow business to sell without a fit without a web page with a website so even you know big companies are trying to um, help small business understanding the severity of the situation i understand uh, i noticed canva a, 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 a presentation and, you know company also working with facebook to help small business create nicer facebook pages so i think big companies are also realizing that they need to help smaller companies and again like you said smaller companies are also working together. Um, so I think maybe in my next talk, um, I'll, I'll think more about um, how companies can partner with each other and uh, cooperate with each other and, uh, and, and thereby uh, improve the situation. But thank you for the question and comment. Thanks for your insights. So we've got a couple of questions in the chat. So. I'm just going to go through the chat. I know we have a couple of other Q&A questions in the box, so I'll address it in the order that I've seen them. And Ryan, we do see your hand raised too, but we'll, we'll get to you as well. So um, Professor Rome asks, uh, love the sports and football metaphors, similar to many market creation strategies I've been reading about. On top of COVID, how should small business owners respond to the recent protests and ongoing movement to help address social and racial injustice? 
Oh, that's a tough one. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, um, I, I guess, I guess, um, you know, you, you can imagine small business people have their hands full uh, and uh, are quite, quite, quite busy. And of course, some some have been, you know, you know impacted um, by by the protests in the sense they can open up their stores at the time they, they want it. Um, but I think, you know, small business owners are just not different from anybody else. I think we need to find a way to, um, um, to support um, the, uh, the movement today and, uh, um, and uh, be, on, be on the right part, uh, side of history. Um, so I think, you know, whatever they can do, whether it's uh, if, certainly if they're profitable and financially okay, find a way to uh, support certain causes. Um, you know, make sure certainly that they're not in any way discriminatory in their hiring practices and the way they treat their employees or customers. So I think everybody has a important role to play. And I'm sure if I can, uh, if I had a little bit more time, I could think of some uh, more better examples. Nola, what do you think? Um, I, I think that you've got it. I think, um, I think making a statement and, and being true to your values as business owners um, is really important. Um, we do see small businesses and large taking a stand. Um, David mentioned the CrossFit community and how several of the small gyms and business owners have gotten emails from my gym owner too that you know, they're taking a stand and disaffiliating. Um, so I think that, that there should be um, some statement, right, um, from, from the small business. So thank you so much for that question. I think it's really timely and very important in, in today's climate um, for all of us to address our, our particular values um, around social justice. So, so again, thank you for that question. Um, we do have a question from Francisco. Uh, how much M&A business do you believe will be happening among small entrepreneurial companies as a result of the current business environment? Okay, so um, the answer is, I don't know, but let me say a couple of things. So um, what, what I see is a lot of business going out of business. Um, and then what I also see um, is, <clears throat> I've, I've heard people say this is a good time to buy companies. So, uh, because a lot of them are going to be struggling and going to be relatively low in valuation. So um, I, I, see, I see signs of M&A activity, um, you know, in that respect, in, in, the, in, the, in the small business world. Um, and, uh, but I don't know much about, I haven't thought too much about it. Um, Again, Nola, what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I'm, I'm not sure because you know, yeah. I think that our business professors are the experts here. But I think that, you know, perhaps in the next few months, once the reopening starts and businesses evaluate where they're at, um, you know, with, with the revenues and so forth, um, there may be some movements. But I think that's one of those uncertainties that we just don't really quite know yet. Um, because we also have to factor in the behaviors of the consumers and what they'll decide to do. Um, I think we've had enough time to kind of adjust to, to our current situation. Um, do we want to support small businesses? Sure. Uh, but you know, what other impacts are there that we're not considering at this stage? I can imagine certain businesses willing to buy the assets of certain struggling businesses, right? Mm -hmm. Or business that are going out of business. I see that. I remember in two th one of the one of the recessions now. I don't know, there's been so many recessions that uh, um, I remember one of the big uh, ski resorts I think was acquired, and it was because you know of course the seller was thinking the economy is so bad I just need to get rid of this right, and at the same time the buyer is thinking oh there's so much opportunity I need to buy this right, so yeah, given different perspectives and different cash positions I think they'll be buying and selling uh, activities as is usual, but uh, you know, I, I can't think of any particular uh, situations or particular examples uh, that are particularly worth mentioning. So Brian, I know you've had your hand up for a while. I'm sure your arm's tired. So we're gonna go ahead and allow you to talk. 
um, you're welcome to unmute yourself and ask your question. Perfect. Hi, David. Uh, can you guys hear me all right? Yep. Perfect. Well, I really appreciate you laying out this presentation. I love the three different plays that uh, you put forward. Um, I think for myself, I really enjoyed sort of taking that same product, different infrastructure approach uh, in our office at LMU. Uh, but I, I think you mentioned earlier, not all of us uh, as attendees are necessarily entrepreneurs, uh, but what are some ways that we can be entrepreneurial within our own companies to help support internally, come up with new programs or different routes to make sure that our whatever org we are working with is still surviving, if not teetering over to that better end and thriving, um, coming up with new ideas? That's a good question. Um, I think, uh, Ryan, I know you work at LMU. <laughs> and, uh, you know, LMU is no different from many organizations in this economy. Uh, it's it's going to be, it is or it's going to be affected. Um, and um, I think, you know, for any organization to thrive in most economies, not to mention this economy, it's got to be entrepreneurial. We got to be innovative in what we do. And what that really means is we all have to be innovative and we all have to be entrepreneurial, right? As employees of an organization. And, uh, you know, so whether it's working longer hours, whether it's, you know, making suggestions, maybe it's leading a group, maybe it's uh, um, doing something innovative, um, maybe it's breaking certain rules, don't break too many, um, you know, maybe. Uh, we all have, need to find a way to be uh, to contribute to the organization, um, and maybe sometimes something you you volunteer. Maybe you, uh, Ryan, I know you're very entrepreneurial. Maybe you find a way to first get very cheap equipment and, and whatever we need. You know, so um, yes, yeah, just think of how you can, you know, in in a, in a small way or in a significant way, uh, contribute to your organization. And you know, and, and really exercise your, on your entrepreneurial leadership, right? That means you know you take action when even nobody actually asks you to do something. You decide I need to do something for my organization, and 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 you find a way to uh, to contribute. I love that. I think a lot of us have hit paralysis um, during these tough times, and even fear like I don't know what to do. But I think that creativity and what you mapped out with just adapting and coming up with those three different roadmaps are definitely helpful for all of us, whether we're running our own business or working within one. So yeah, thanks. Thank you, Ryan. Thanks, Brian. And actually, that's a great transition to Travis's question. So Travis, I'll go ahead and read your entire question. So thank you, David. It's good to see you again. My business provides outsourced accounting and planning solutions for business management owners and decision makers. I wanted to know if you had any thoughts on how professional Consulting businesses like mine can reach out to, network with, and gain additional business partners during these times. Many businesses aren't in the position to consider adding additional expenditures. Many can't meet in person or network in traditional ways, very true. Though partnering with someone like me will almost always result in cost savings for the business. Right now, preserving cash is a top priority, limiting additional spending. Many decision makers I have been able to speak to say they aren't in a position to make those expenditures right now. Do you have any thoughts or strategies you would recommend for finding and connecting with people in the socially distant world we're in right now? Thank you. Okay, good question. By the way, I'm realizing it's really hard <laughs> to be answering all these different questions in a very short period of time. Um, you know, I just, I've been having a conversation with a small business consulting company recently. And uh, they, they also agree uh, that um, they're, I, I learned that success rate in acquiring customers has gotten a little lower recently. Uh, they, they used to be very high uh, when they pitched a bit their business, they used to get a certain percentage of their uh, customers. They used to acquire certain percentage of customers. That's gotten a little lower. But I think if your proposition is, hey, we can you know, help you reduce your cost and improve your cash potential, um, I think that's a pretty compelling value proposition. Um, and um, so, you know, I, I don't have any great ideas, um, but I'll, I'll just uh, um, 
keep, keep trying. And um, I guess I would, you know, try to join as many professional organizations as possible so you, you can, uh, they can get to know you better. This one particular uh, consulting company that I talked to recently, um, what they do is they, they offer two, offer some sample sessions of consulting uh, for free. And of course, you know, if you go through that process as a business, you find out that these guys are really valuable. And so maybe that's something I might suggest to you is maybe uh, offer a few sessions, maybe, you know, and or, or some advisory sessions um, or maybe even some, some kind of service sessions at a discount of free. So that let them um, try you out and, and see the value of your business. I don't know if that helps, but uh, uh, that's the strategy of this one particular company that I've been talking to and they've been pretty effective. So hopefully that helps a little bit. Thank you, Travis, for your question. Um, we've got about three minutes left um, before we end. And if there are any additional questions anyone would like to pose, do so now or if we ever hold your peace. I see one other hand, right? Okay, great. Let me, uh, yes. Flamena? Yeah, hi. Um, thank you so much for your presentation. I think it was very useful to hear from someone who's really researching and not just, you know, I'm like constantly subscribed to a lot of newsletters and trying to follow what's going on. And <laughs> it's really, really hard to stare at my screen for such a long time. Mm -hmm. And listening and hearing the information definitely helps with it sinking more. Um, I just wanted to ask you about in terms of remote um, jobs, because I feel like before this was happening, there was a lot of business in traveling and meeting with business partners around the world and having conferences and doing a lot of a lot more um just traveling in general within your career um now that this has happened and people have been doing a lot more online and remote work do you think it will get carried over to when our new normal happens do you think like this will definitely change a lot of the ways people work in terms of putting costs with traveling and meeting and conferences and all of that. Okay. Um, that's a good question. You know, even uh, at LMU, we, we think, we often think that uh, there's a chance that, you know, even when everything's perfect again, we can, we can be next to each other and we have vaccines and stuff like that. We think of sometimes that, uh, certain courses may be partially online. And uh, you can imagine a situation where a, a fact member travels to go to a conference. He or she may, you know, still offer a course online. So I think this, this, you know, this virtual getting together is probably gonna uh, happen more frequently um, than before. I don't think that means that, um, you know, a huge percentage of travel is gonna go away or the huge percentage of, you know, business travel is going to go away. Um, so I think, uh, um, I think it will affect some of it, whether it's going to be 10%, 20%, 30%. I have absolutely no clue. I can imagine, you know, in, um, by the way, you know, even in classroom, you know, we can bring in guest speakers more easily from anywhere around the world. So I think we're going to do this on a more regular basis. But in the past, I used to be a consultant and I used to fly out Monday morning, 5 a.m., get back Thursday or Friday in the evenings. And you know, if there's a way to reduce that you know, 20%, I would have loved it, right? So I, I can imagine you know, we having less of that. Having said that, you know, being able to be next to clients, in front of clients, talking, chatting, and then actually find the most valuable information by just having lunch and joking around uh, so that, you know, that's important. I can't imagine, you know, too much of uh, travel going away in the future. Okay. Great. Thank you so much, Um So it's 
exactly noon now, and I would like to thank everyone for joining us today for our first webinar. And um, I just wanted to also mention, Jacqueline um, mentioned that connecting with the chamber or a chamber um, in your local community is also a great idea for networking. We're doing the same thing. So thank you, Jacqueline, for that recommendation. Um, so again, thank you so much for joining us. Please join us on Thursday. We've got um, overview of the CARES Act, tax planning opportunities um, with Joe Mouthy, who is with Deloitte Tax Planning. And um, we hope you can join us again soon. And thank you so much for, for joining us. Thank you, Nola. Thank you. For your help, appreciate it. Thank you, Dale. Thank you, Dale. Thank you all. Have a great rest of your day and hope to see you next time.